I should start by thanking BioPoint team for inviting me here. I'm really honored to be in a vet congress in a foreign country and always enthusiastic to meet colleagues from other countries and exchange our experiences and maybe our doubts about our profession. So I, I should say some things about how uh, poultry business is structured in Greece so that you can understand some things and my perspective of veterinary practice. Poultry business is totally integrated. That means that every company has its own slaughterhouse, its own hatchery, its own feed mill. So they make a contract with the farmer, they have a fixed price for the chicks, for the feed, and of course the live weight uh, when they sell their chicks to the purchase to the slaughterhouse. Five companies represent more than 80% of the broiler production in Greece, 90% of breeders, and unfortunately there are only two independent hatcheries. That's not good for the vet professions because actually everyone that's uh, messing with poultry and is a vet, most of them are vet employees of the companies. I have worked for the two biggest integrators in Greece for 12 years. The last seven years I'm also a freelancer. I have my own private practice. And from since last month I decided to, to be 100% uh, freelancer. So, I would start, I would start with to, for, to speak about coccidiosis. I'm wondering why actually do we have coccidiosis problems right now? We have very good disinfectants. We have vaccines against coccidiosis. We have coccidiostats. We have medicine against coccidiosis disease. Why is it really the case? We passed the summer in Greece with increased cases of coccidiosis with acervulina and tenella. The vets were arguing, the rotation programs with coccidiostat was okay, biosecurity was okay, disinfections were okay. What could be the cause? I think we cannot actually talk about coccidiosis without take, taking other consideration other two factors that cause uh, intestinal disease. Necrotic enteritis, as you all know, and dysbacteriosis. All vets easily diagnose coccidiosis and necrotic enteritis. So they visit the farm, they diagnose it, they give a medication. Most of the cases we give some amoxicillin or anything else for necrotic enteritis, and it actually goes well. From the second day, the farmer is happy. But there are a lot of cases that we treat coccidiosis but the farmer is not happy because a week or 10 days later he has coccidiosis again and he's complaining. Why is really that? I think it's the third case that makes all the damage. When we visit the farm and we have coccidiosis or necrotic enteritis, in most cases we also have this bacteriosis. Not only that, this bacteriosis was happening at least five or six days before coccidiosis or necrotic enteritis. So when we treat about necrotic enteritis, we also treat for this bacteriosis, so it's going well. But when we treat coccidiosis, we do not treat this bacteriosis. So most of the cases it doesn't go well. I'm talking about management of Intestine, intestinal health. We should think as health managers. We are not really vets. A vet is trying to save an animal. We are not trying to save broilers. We are trying to, to have good production results. To be able to do that, we should have good knowledge of feed formulas, feed formulations. We should have good knowledge of management and not only pathology. Working for 12 years in integrators, I was asked to know about anything. So 
it was uh, a common situation that the general manager was calling me in his office at the end of the day. How is production, Vagelis? And I said, it's okay. Okay is not enough. I made a good barking and I want to slaughter the flocks four days earlier. I wanted the same weight. It's simple, isn't it? So let's see some factors. Uh, ah, sorry. Uh, why are they important? This, all these three factors that I said. Of course, the high feed conversion ratio. Growth retardation. The slaughterhouse complains because does not does not have the weight to sell. For example, in Greece, a uh, good price in the market is 2.5. No more than 2.5. It's 2.3 to 2.5. This is the best price they can achieve. Poor slaughter quality due to condemnation. High medication cost. We, estima we, estima uh, we estimate that 70% of therapies in Greece have to do with these things. So we already charge a lot of money to the farmers. So we're in a difficult situation when something else happens. A simple E. coli infection, maybe. And of course, all of that results in a poor income for the farmer. So let's see which are the predisposing factors for all these things. Density, of course. The birds are stressed. Stress mechanism gives a uh, production of corticosteroids. We have immunosuppression. You all know it. So secondary pathogens of the intestine, like oxidia, like clostridium, will make a party. Poor management. Poor management. We all have good farmers and bad farmers. We have to work with it. We have wet litter. We could have coccidiosis. Drug resistance. And when I say drug resistance, I'm also referring to coccidiostats. The temperature. Usually in late summer, when it's really hot, more often we see necrotic arteritis than coccidiosis. While in autumn or fall, with high humidity because of the rains, we most often see coccidiosis. The feed. Is it important? For me, it's the most important. Let, I am writing protein source. Let's start with fat source. I don't know if you can, uh, if you go to the farms and you have knowledge of what the birds are eating actually. If you have animal fat, it's a good source of fat, at least, uh, uh, as long as it's not hyperoxidized. If it's oxidized, you have epithelial cell damage to the intestine. So a lot of things can go wrong. Protein source, animal protein. If the feed meals use for example, fish meal, to have the protein levels they need, it's okay. Fish meal is an excellent source of protein with a very rich amino acid profile, but it's correlated to necrotic arteritis incidence. But nowadays, with crisis things, most of the feed meals try to have protein levels from other sources, like wheat, sunflower, EDGS. EDGS is an extract uh, of grains. So actually what's left from grain processing, they take it back. They make a, a, an extract out of it and they feed the birds. All of these things are full of non-starch non polysaccharides. What does it mean? It means that it takes a lot f for the feed to pass through the intestine. That causes an epithelial damage. We will have dysbacteriosis, and depends on the case, it can lead to either coccidiosis or to necrotic enteritis. The formulation of it, is it pelleted or is it mash? Mash feed is much more physical to the bird. You have, uh, we have a good uh, gizzard development because actually gizzard has to work. Protein does not enter the gut, so we rarely see necrotic arteritis. We more often will see 
coccidiosis problems if we have mass feed. Do we have, do we have pelleted feed? If we have pelleted feed, actually the gizzard doesn't have to work. That's really bad. It does not develop. Liver does not have to work. That's bad as well. So we have a lot of protein entering the gut. That's not acceptable. We will have a lot of necrotic enteritis and dysbacteriosis in that case. Which are the methods to diagnose this situation? I told you before, in my opinion, this bacteriosis is always present when we go to farms. We don't need, we do not diagnose it. Then we are called back from the farmers because they have mortality and we see either coccidiosis or necrotic enteritis. We are already late to do something and we do not have the time we are talking about a flock that will be slaughtered in 41 days, so we go one week later. We don't do much, do we? So we have to do lesson scoring when we visit farms. We can, well, maybe we go to a farm where there is no mortality. The farmer is happy, doesn't see anything. But we are there, so we should open birds. At least 10 to 15 birds and do a lesson scoring to the intestine. The lesser scoring for this bacteriosis has to do with intestinal mobility. When we open the bird from negative pressure, it goes to positive pressure. It actually has to move to react to that. If it does not react, that's a case. Absence or present of intestinal dilution. Do we have gas in the intestine? So we have proliferation of pathogens. Thickness of intestinal wall. The thinnest the wall, sometimes we go to farms with they have the, that don't have any obvious problem, but we open the birds and we can see through the wall. That's plus four for this bacteriosis. We have to give something. Undigested feed in the intestine, we have this bacteriosis. For necrotic enteritis, of course, you all know it. it's more easy because we also have mortality, clinical symptoms, and so on. But we have to give something when we have this bacteriosis. And normally, it's three or four days before necrotic enteritis happen. For coccidiosis, you all know a lot of things. Uh, the traditional method would be microscopic examination. Do we really have the time to do it? I don't think so. The lesson scoring is more and more uh, used right now. It's from plus one to plus four for all species of Imeria, and it has to do with the lessons. In intensive production, only preventive therapy is economically rational. I don't like the word, the phrase preventive therapy. If it's preventive, it's not therapy, right? But a lot of, uh, a lot of vets use it. For me, it's health management, actually. We have to be there and we have to treat before clinical symptoms start. Our aim is good production results, so we want the farmer to be satisfied with us, so we, have, we should have daily gain uh, acceptable. The most common uh, medication uh, drugs in Greece for this bacteriosis and necrotic enteritis are tilosine and amoxicillin and tilmicosin. For coccidiosis, it's tortrazuril by Cox and ESB3, sulfaconoxaline, and herbal products. The last five years, believe it or not, herbal products are the products of choice. One important reason is residual times. It's 18 days for Bicox and 23 days for ESB3. So we have a coccidiosis case at 25 uh, days. We cannot give uh, these products. Cost effectiveness. Herbal products, if we use it right, are much cheaper than conventional products. And the ethical part, which is really important. There's a, there's a lot of talking about 
reducing uh, antimicrobial use. The media uh, are uh, saying all the time about it, and poultry vets are the target, uh, actually. They don't mention a lot of things about the other kind of animals. So it's a case. It's a good weapon for us to, to show that we are doing something. We have something to suggest as a vets and to protect our profession. Now, about BioPoint products. First of all, I have to say that I was the first vet in Greece that used herbal products. It was 10 years ago. It was not BioPoint products, it was a French from a French company. I was the first, not only not before because I'm good, not good, I'm just open-minded. So actually, they went very well. The last four years, I'm using Alizan and Coxilin. The first product that I used from BioPoint was Alizan. It has been used as the only solution and it went extremely well. Farmers were pleased. The therapeutic dose that I used it was one liter per ton of water for 24 hours a day for three to four days. For, lit for a few cases, for a fourth day of medication was needed, but it was few cases. And the production results were good. Coxilin. I stopped using Alizan and I use Coxilin now. I'm a fan of coxilin. Why? I use it either at one liter per ton, to 12 hours per day, or one liter per two tons, 24 hours per day. What I see is that coxilin, more than alizan, not only works in coxidiosis, but also uh, works in our enemy, this bacteriosis. So it's been three years that I use coxilin. Farmers are happy. They ask it themselves. Can you imagine it? They are phoning me and I want to put coxilin. I have trained them and they know where, when to put it. They don't expect to have coxidiosis. And what the farmers see, the great difference they see is better fit conversion. And actually, that means more money. So I was really anxious what's going on and why it, is it working so well. I found a friend of mine, a lecturer in microbiology of the University of Thessaloniki, when, where I graduated. So I explained to him, and I say, I want your opinion. I want to make a study and see what's going on. Does it work actually in vitro and in vivo to uh, microorganism, say okay, set up a protocol and we start. We have finished the protocol right now. I can show you only the production results because they are university guys. They don't want me to show you the university results before we publish it. Okay. So my thinking was the same as I use it in routine cases. And which are the routine cases? When do I expect to have intestinal disorders? I expect it to be when there is a change in the feed. So in Greece, the first 16 days is the first stage feed. From 16 days and older, they change to second stage feed. And then at 26 days, they change to third age feed. So for me, the crucial periods are 16 days and 26 days. I, exp I expect a lot of bad things to happen in the intestine. So I chose a very high management farm. He could weigh the feed in his silos. He could weigh the birds. It's consisted of three houses of 70,000 boilers each. House number one and number two were ideal because they had the same hatching edge for the same breeder farm and of course the same age. 
At house number one, we administrated coxylin at one liter per ton, 12 hours a day, at the crucial periods I mentioned, from day 16 to day 20, 18, and from day 26 to 28. Before and after each administration, weight, lesson scoring were performed. Not only this, but I took uh, 20 samples from each building that I sent to the university before administration and after administration. And what, what we did, what I suggested to, to the university guys, is that, that we should measure in the testing Clostridium and Derococcus and E. coli. Because I was curious to see what the population would be before and after administration. These are the two houses that uh, we made the protocol. You see that it's a new farm. So, we, I go there at 16 days. I visit the farm. There's no problem. You see the, the weights. It's day 16. It's 557 grams. It's house number one. And this is house number two. It's 579 it's heavier. They are the same birds. So I ask the farmer, which house do you want to put coxylin? And he says, of course, I want to put it in number one. Because number two is heavier. I said, okay, no problem with that. So I got, we administrated coxylin. I didn't go for to day... 19 because it was Saturday and I didn't have time to go. I went on Monday. It was day 21. This is house number one that we put coxylin. It's 954 grams. This is house number two that we administrated nothing. It's 942 grams. You see the difference? Number one was lighter, and now it's heavier. In what? In five days. Why? I don't know why they put in coxylin if they put something that makes the bird heavy. I don't, I don't think so. I think it worked in this bacteriosis because we had no problems, no mortality, no coccidiosis, nothing. So then... We did the same at 26 days. But house number two, which was the control house, suffered from necrotic arteritis twice. So we had to administrate amoxicillin twice. The farmer was not happy. At house number one, that we administrated twice coxylin, nothing happened. So look at the 26, it's just after medication for necrotic arteritis in house number two. Look at the weights. 1.3 in the coxillin house, 1.300, 1 uh, uh, 1.1 at the control house. Then we had to treat again for amoxicillin. 1.5, 1.3. The difference is, I think, significant. The flock was slaughtered at 43 days. The coxillin house had 2.683 grams. And we only administered coxillin twice. House number two was 2.574. After we did twice amoxicillin medication, and you can imagine the cost. The feed conversion, it house, no, it house number one, it was 1.75. At house number two, it was 1.82. Mortality was almost the same, and that's because we medicated uh, at once, so we actually didn't have mortality for mycotic arteritis just for one day. But the, the, you can see the difference in the feed conversion. The medicine costs including vaccines, vitamins, everything. It was five cents per bird at house number one. 
and the hatchery course inside, of course. It was eight cents per bird, in house number two. The profit for the farmer was eight cents per bird higher in the coxilling house. This farm now is uh, a flock after it. He's uh, 40 days old. He has done exactly the same thing to all his houses, and he has four houses. He administrated coxilling to all houses by himself. He said, I want to do it. Yeah, okay, you can do it. What exactly I mean when I say this bacteriosis, because some of you may argue uh, there are some uh, terms like bacterial enteritis, it's all acceptable. I'm uh, uh, showing this picture to you because I want you to understand what I mean lesson scoring. Look at the intestinal walls, you can see inside it. Okay, that's plus four in lesson scoring when we are talking about intestinal wall. Look at the intestinal dilution. It's gas, everywhere you can see it. It's also plus four. You cannot see the mobility, but you can imagine that this test is like dead. Okay? What would you say if you visited a farm with no mortality, good weights, and you open birds, you see intestines like that, give, give nothing and leave. We don't do our job this way. We're not efficient for the farmer. If we see this picture, we have to treat. If we have to treat, we, we will have a good production result and the farmer will be happy. Herbal products can surely solve coccidiosis cases. I used them personally for 10 years. It was also good for me because I made a difference with other vets. I charged less the farmers with the same results. It's good for me for farmers that are really ethical and are not really likely to give medications every week. It's an advantage for me. Coxilin, if you administrate it the way, the, way, the way I mentioned, can give you very good results. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>